You're watching Reason and Theology Live, a show dedicated to charitable discussions, debates, interviews, commentary, and analysis. And now, your host, Michael Lofton. And welcome to Reason and Theology, everyone. Your host, Michael, on a Thursday afternoon in San Diego, California, at Catholic Answers. So yeah, you probably noticed that I'm not in Monroe right now. The background looks a little different. Yeah sitting in the man himself uh, in his desk, Cy Kellett. Uh, they were generous enough to let me sit here and do a live stream. So here we are. By the way, y'all can put some questions there in the chat. Make sure to put them to at Reason and Theology, and I'll do my best to get to them. But first, before I do a Q&A, I wanted to touch on the question of the fate of unbaptized infants. Where do unbaptized infants go when they die. According to the Catholic Church, do they go to hell? Um, do they go to heaven? What exactly is their fate? And one of the reasons why I'm touching on this is just because it's a topic that comes up so often. It's also dear to my heart, and it's related to um, a discussion that I just had with Cy here in, in studio at Catholic Answers, um, where we just shot a video that will air July 20th on the Catholic Answers Focus podcast, and it's on the question of, will hell ever be empty? Hmm. Well, uh, we, we, we tackle that one there. I won't give you uh, any sneak peeks. You'll just have to wait until July 20th to find out uh, where we go with that one. But on a related topic, again, um, what is the fate of un, an unbaptized infant? Do they go to hell? Is that where they will spend eternity? Are they separated from God for all eternity? Why is this even a question? Um, well, we have to understand original sin. We have to understand the importance of baptism. Uh, we have to understand what hell is, what heaven is. So all that will become clear uh, once we maybe define some of our terms. Uh, so let's maybe do that first before I answer the question, what is the Catholic view on uh, the fate of unbaptized infants? So let's, again, define our terms. What do we mean by hell? Um, hell can, of course, be understood in multiple ways, but what's most relevant to us is what we would call limbo. And so, yes, actually, limbo is a compartment to use, just kind of a crude analogy here. Um, it's a section, if you will, of hell. Again, I understand that, please understand that this is just analogical. It's not necessarily that hell's actually divided into physical compartments or something like that, but we can speak conceptually um, of some distinctions when we speak of hell. We can speak of the hell of the damned, where people who have committed grave sins against God and have hardened their heart um, against God, where they would go. Um, but we can also speak of a, a concept known as limbo, which is just a term that refers to the fringe or border of hell. So again, yes, limbo is a... Um, aspect of hell, but it's on the fringe. It's on the border. It's it's not the same place where somebody who is hardened against God and has committed all kinds of horrible atrocities um, and has died unrepentant. Uh, it's, it's, it's not that place. That's not limbo. Um, although we can speak of both as hell, there's clearly a distinction there. Um, so again, limbo is considered a uh, the fringe or the border of hell, but it is understood in Catholic theology as a place of perfect natural happiness and even natural communion with God. And that might sound odd. I mean, wait, what? You're talking about happiness and communion in hell? Again, we're talking about the fringe, the border of it, not the place where the damned go, not the place where the people who hate God and want to be separated from him um, go. Uh, that That is by no means a place of natural happiness, right? Uh, so we again, we can make a distinction there. Um, so when we're speaking of limbo, we're talking about not a place of um, wailing and gnashing of teeth, as scripture uh, refers to when it's speaking of the hell of the damned. It's a place of, again, natural happiness. And why are we speaking of natural happiness? Well, it's opposed to supernatural happiness, which is known as heaven or the beatific vision in Catholic theology. This is the idea that um, 
union with God is not necessarily something that is just our natural end. It is a our it's considered our supernatural end. It's something, if you will, that is an added gift to our nature. Although we we have to be a little careful here because we could say, well, didn't God create you naturally to be with in, be with him in heaven and in communion with him? Yes, 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 yes. That's not what we mean, however, when we make this distinction between natural and supernatural union with God. What we're trying to say is not that this wasn't native or original to what God wanted for us. What we're saying is that there's nothing you could do to naturally merit or naturally achieve heaven. It has to be something that is given to you, that is added uh, by grace. So that's what we mean here by uh, our supernatural end as opposed to a natural end. Um, well, again, he, here we have to have grace in order to achieve this end. Well, how is grace communicated in Catholic theology? Well, generally, grace is communicated through the sacraments, right? Especially baptism. That's that's going to be one of the initial ways in which God... Um, communicates grace to individuals. Is God bound by baptism? Is that the only way that he can communicate grace to people? Of course not. God is not bound by the sacraments, as Catholic theology notes. Um, but he does ordinarily use the sacraments. It's, it's the ordinary means by which he um, generally uses to communicate grace. But again, he's not bound to it. Um, so here, when we speak of baptism, this is generally the way that God uses to usher a person into union with him and into this supernatural state, because again, it's not something that can be achieved naturally. It has to be achieved through sacraments and some kind of supernatural intervention on God's part. And again, that's what happens in uh, baptism. That's the, one of the graces that's communicated in baptism. Okay, but we're now speaking about an infant who has not been baptized. Well, why do infants even need to be baptized? Well, I'm mentioning here that, again, the infant doesn't have a natural capacity to enjoy God in the beatific vision. This is not something that one naturally achieves. Um, and also, they don't have any natural right. Nobody is owed communion, and especially a supernatural communion. Nobody is owed that. God doesn't owe heaven to anybody. It's something that is unmerited. It's something that is gratuitous. It's grace. Um, so even an infant, though they haven't committed any sins, you know, that they've actually done, um, have, have they done anything to merit that supernatural experience? No, no. And does God owe it to them? No. So if they're, they are going to attain that supernatural end, the infant has to receive God's grace. And again, the ordinary means by which he does that is baptism, which is one of the reasons why we baptize infants is because, again, this is one of the ordinary means that God uses to convey the supernatural gift, supernatural grace to, to infants so that they can enjoy him in heaven. Again, what we call the beatific vision so that they can achieve their supernatural end. Well, what happens if a an infant is unbaptized? Well, the concern here is every infant contracts what we would call original sin. In original sin, the way to understand it, it's multifaceted, but original sin is not something that you personally do. Uh, so it's not what we would call actual sin, where I, I personally choose to go against God's law. Um, original sin is a condition that we're born in. And what is this condition? Well, in the Garden of Eden, God originally um, created Adam and Eve. And Adam and Eve enjoyed communion with God. They had sanctifying grace. They were morally upright. These were things that they experienced. And after Adam sinned, Adam and Eve both sinned, they lost that sanctifying grace. They lost that moral uprightness. And um, the disposition that they had that was previously oriented towards God became, 
curved inward and disposed to um, the individual rather than to God. Well, that condition of being deprived of sanctifying grace, and again here sanctifying grace is understood as um, a supernatural experience and union with God. So you you, you can understand it that way. Um, uh, although we, we could speak of more aspects to sanctifying grace, I think that'll, that'll do for our purposes here. Um, that's lost after the fall. So that anyone who is born from Adam is born in a state where they no longer have that sanctifying grace and that moral uprightness. They're curved inward. And there's a penalty of death that is owed for anyone uh, who is born in this condition. Um, now, that doesn't necessarily mean that this individual who is born into the situation is somehow as culpable as perhaps a Hitler who was engaged in all kinds of actual sins, right? We're not, we're not saying that those things are equal, but, but what we are saying is that every individual, even if they're an, um, an infant who is just recently born, um, at the very least is born into a situation where they, they don't have sanctifying grace. And so they're, not, they're in and of themselves unable to reach that natural end of union with God. So to, if you will, remove that state of original sin from them, um, they are to be baptized. That removes original sin, and it adds grace and adds, especially supernatural grace, that ability to see God in heaven if they die, which is why we believe that a, a recently born infant who is baptized, if they die, we believe since they're baptized, they enjoy God in, in heaven. Um, but if they are unbaptized, and if they die in a state of original sin, which they surely contract originally um, because of Adam, um, if they die in that state, God has not removed that original sin um, in some kind of extraordinary way, we would say that they would go to limbo, which is that part of hell that is on the border and it's a place of natural happiness so when we speak of an infant here if they die in the state of original sin going to hell we're not saying that they go to the place where some horrible person goes who's committed all kinds of terrible sins somebody like a hitler or a nero caesar we're not saying they go there, but what we're saying is they they are not able to achieve the beatific vision because they don't have that supernatural capacity. So they're kind of in this in intermediate state between those two extremes. Um, but as, as a person who's there in limbo, they're still able to have this natural union with God and natural communion with Him. It's not supernatural. It's not what you would have when God intervenes and brings grace and elevates your nature, if you will. But it is something that you can experience um, naturally according to your natural end. You can have this natural happiness and natural knowledge and communion of God. Um, you, you can th think of it like this. What limbo is, is the best possible life that you could ever have and it does not stop it's the greatest life that you could have in 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 this world if you will uh, devoid of sin right <laughs> in the context where there isn't sin the best life that you can have could have the greatest experience of joy that you could have naturally speaking that's what limbo is all the time and the greatest knowledge that you can have of God and union and communion that you could have with God naturally, that's what limbo is. But it's not, again, a supernatural union with God and a supernatural um, knowledge of Him that a person would receive only if, if they've had their uh, nature elevated through the sacraments. So there is a loss there. We can speak of a loss of the beatific vision, a loss of heaven, even for anyone if they were if they are in the limbo of infants. Um, but there's no sense of pain and suffering because they haven't committed any actual sins. Uh, so again, the only loss there that we can speak of is um, a loss of the beatific vision. Um,
So the, then the question now is, okay, well, do infants actually go there, right? I mean, we've spoken about this theoretically. If an uh, infant dies in a state of original sin, this is why they would go to limbo. And we've spoken about what that would look like. But the question still remains, but do they actually go there? You know, do they actually die in a state of original sin if they weren't baptized? Is, is that providentially what God allows? Well, Again, the ordinary means and the only way that we have as humans to usher them into the kingdom of heaven is to give them baptism. But then the question is, if we fail to do so for some reason, we're unable to baptize the infant, um, they don't get access to it, or their parents don't even believe in um, baptism, and the infant were to die, um, you know, the question then is, okay, well, do they die in this state of original sin where they now go to limbo? Or does God remit and remove that original sin in some kind of extra sacramental, extraordinary way? Well, we can certainly say that God is capable of doing that because God is capable of saving people apart from the sacraments. And this is something that even the Council of Trent notes. It speaks about how it's necessary to receive the sacraments uh, to go to heaven. They're, they're necessary. Um, but it also notes that if someone is unable to actually receive the sacraments, a desire for the sacraments is sufficient for them to receive the grace. Um, so just merely desiring it, but just being unable to, to reach the font of baptism, for example, um, God would still give them the grace that is necessary. And we see this historically in the concept of baptism of desire, um, or martyrdom, you know, baptism of blood. Um, so this is certainly a, a traditional concept, and it is also su substantiated by Trent, um, but the question still remains, does this apply to infants? Because when we speak of baptism of desire, we're talking about people who have the capacity to desire heaven. Well, what about infants? Um do they have that desire? Um, it's it's curious because we do see some instances in the Gospels where one person exercises faith on behalf of another, a person who's paralyzed, for example. Uh, you see some others who exercise faith on their be on the paralyzed person's behalf, and that person is then healed by Jesus, and their sins are forgiven. Um, so sometimes you do see this kind of vicarious exercise of faith, even in the New Testament. So the question that is, okay, well, could a parent vicariously exercise faith on baptize, you know, on behalf of their infant? And if they're unable to baptize them, would that faith be sufficient? So this kind of vicarious faith, um, is the, is that is that sufficient? Can we speak of that as baptism of desire? You have some people who put this forward. Um, Kayatan is one of them. Some call or pronounce it Kajatan. Uh, he was he was a proponent of that view, which some people misunderstand and think it was censored by the Pope. That's not true. Um, that's a misunderstanding of the situation, but we're, we're getting a little off track, so I, I digress. Um, but you do have the helm. You also have uh, Prosper of Aquitaine, uh, one of the church fathers. I believe it was Prosper of Aquitaine, if I recall correctly, who puts forward in one of his books a, a very similar concept of baptism of desire. He sees the um, parents of, you know, the the parents, well, yeah, the parents of an infant um, as able to exercise faith on their behalf and desire for their child to enjoy God and the beatific vision, but they're unable to give them baptism. He, he sees that as sufficient for that infant um, to receive God's grace to go to heaven. Um, so this is also something that you find even in the patristic era, and it's often overlooked in these discussions. A lot of people don't realize that it's it's there in Prosper of Accutane. Um, So this is not something that's just original to Kayatan way later in the Middle Ages. It's, it's, it's certainly in the patristic era. Um, so is it then possible for God to somehow... Um, give grace to an infant extra sacramentally. Yes, it's possible, and I just gave you an example. There, there might be other examples that we just don't know about. That you know, in some way only known to God, He conveys um, ba baptism or the grace of baptism to these infants. Um, there, there's hints of this even in Thomas Aquinas, where he he thinks that 
grace could be communicated in some kind of extraordinary way to an infant in the womb, perhaps by an angel or something like that. Um, so can God do this? Yes. Does it have to be in the way that I just described, this vicarious baptism of desire? No, it could be in some other way, only known to God. But that's just one theory. Um, so what this translates into is that we can have hope that an infant has had their um, original sin remitted and God has given them the graces of baptism, um, you know, apart from the administration of baptism, if they were unable to receive it for some reason. We can have a hope that God would give them this grace and that they're enjoying God in the beatific vision. Can we have certainty? No, be, because it's certainly a possibility that God has not given them that grace and that they have died in a state of original sin and they're they're experiencing god only in a natural way in limbo what the council of florence would call hell but it distinguishes between a hell of um where people who have committed uh actual sins go and a hell of people who have only died in a state of original sin go um and that's a reference to limbo conceptually um so we can have a hope, and this is something that the post-conciliar era has highlighted, is that we can have that kind of hope. So you can see it in the liturgy for an unbaptized infant in the Catholic Church. We have an expression of hope. We also have hope expressed in the magisterial documents of Vatican II that talks about um, God in, in, in some way really only known to him makes everyone, uh, makes the Paschal mystery available to everyone. So he makes salvation available to everyone, according to Vatican II, in a way on, only known to God um, in some cases. But he makes it available. That doesn't necessarily mean that they achieve it, but he, he does give them that opportunity. So that has to include unbaptized infants who are unable to reach the baptismal font. Um, so you you definitely see precedent for it in the pre pre conciliar era. It's highlighted in the post conciliar era that we can have this hope. But can we have certitude and you know certainty that that's where they go? No, no. Um, so here's what this translate translates into: worst case scenario in the Catholic perspective. Worst case scenario: if God does not remit the original sin of an un, uh, unbaptized infant. Worst case scenario: they enjoy God naturally. And they have natural happiness for all eternity. That's not bad. So, I mean, limbo is not a sorrowful place. If we speak of it in, sor in a sorrowful term, I guess it would only be insofar as a loss of the beatific vision. Um, but um, it's it's not necessarily something that they will really understand and experience because they never knew the beatific vision. They never knew heaven. So it's kind of like you don't really miss what you never knew. Um, so worst case scenario, if they're in limbo, um, they're enjoying God naturally and have a natural even communion with some of the saints, it says, a natural one. Uh, so maybe family members who are in heaven, they have a natural communion with them and a natural knowledge and, and experience of God. Um, but it's not elevated. It's not the supernatural experience that the saints enjoy in the beatific vision in heaven. That's the worst case scenario. Well, that doesn't sound bad. But best case scenario is God remits it, that original sin extra sacramentally before they die and gives them the graces necessary to achieve the beatific vision and enjoy him in heaven. Okay, well, that's the best case scenario. It could be that it's a combination of both. Maybe maybe some some infants God has them um, allows them to go to limbo, whereas others he allows to enjoy the beatific vision. You might say that's unfair. It's not unfair. God doesn't owe anybody heaven. He doesn't owe that to anybody. So you can't say that's unjust of God because to say it's unjust, you have to say, well, God owes them heaven. God owes them the beatific vision. No, he doesn't. That's Pelagianism. That's a condemned heresy in the Catholic Church. God doesn't owe anybody um, anything. Um so it's it's possible that maybe some infants he allows them to go to limbo, whereas others he allows to go to heaven. It could be that he allows all infants to go to heaven. It could be that he allows all of them go, to go to limbo. It, it could be whatever God allows. But those are the worst case scenarios and best case scenarios, if you will. Teresa H., you're asking a great question there in the chat. She's asking, do aborted babies have baptism of blood? That's certainly been one theory that some people have proposed, although I do think that's a bit of a stretch. 
uh, because baptism of blood is more dying for the sake of Christ, whereas that's not necessarily what's happening in abortion. Um, but I totally am sympathetic to that view. But I don't necessarily favor it for that reason. I more favor an idea of vicarious baptism of desire um, or some way only known to God. You know, um, But that's only a hope. We don't know with certainty that God actually does that, right? Um, Cooper Johnson so asks, so limbo would be like the Garden of Eden? Like, like, but I don't want to say the same because in the Garden of Eden they had this sanctifying grace, whereas um, you wouldn't you wouldn't say that a limbo, uh, an infant in limbo is enjoying sanctifying sanctifying grace. So I'd, I would make a distinction there, but that kind of natural, more natural union and knowledge and communion with God that you kind of see there in the Garden of Eden, that would effectively be it. Um, some have also, by the way, suggested that, okay, well, if some of these infants go to limbo, they would go there only until the second coming and the final judgment, and at the final judgment, God would admit them extra sacramentally and elevate their nature supernaturally by giving them grace. Um, he would give that to them um, after the, the final judgment. So after the final judgment, they would they would experience God in heaven. Um that, that's the position of some. I, I think that was the view of uh, Jacques Maritain, uh, the French theologian. I think that was his perspective, that eventually limbo would be emptied and uh, those, those, those individuals, individuals in limbo would be given that extra sacramental grace then. I mean, it's, it's not excluded in Catholic theology. I mean, that's possible. But that's a very, I think, that's a more novel Per perspective. I don't think that that's very, very common. I think that's more of a novel perspective. It doesn't make it wrong, but it does mean we should be very cautious with it. Um, hmm. Ramses asks, uh, will the saved parents of unbaptized infants get to see their children in the afterlife? Well, the, again, the concept here is if these children are in limbo, uh, those children in limbo could have a natural communion with their parents who are in heaven, but it would only be a natural communion. They, they would not have this kind of supernatural shared experience because uh, their nature hasn't been elevated, but they, they could have a natural communion with their family members. It's possible. Um, and I, I want to say Aquinas may have spoken about that. I'd have to go back and look. I know it's definitely uh, been proposed. Um, somebody is mentioning their Abraham's bosom, and it's what we call paradise. And that's true, but that's known as limbo of the fathers, which is distinct from what we're talking about, which is limbo of infants. Limbo of the fathers applies to the unrighteous, I'm sorry, the righteous souls prior to the resurrection and ascension. Where did they go when they died? They went to Abraham's bosom, which is also known as paradise, um, which is also known as limbo of the fathers. Now, it would seem Limbo of the Fathers is no longer populated. Uh, since after the resurrection and ascension, Christ took those captives who were there and brought them. And they, you know, they, they ascended into heaven with him. So they're enjoying God now in the beatific vision. Uh, as Benedict XIII um, defined, the saints enjoy God now in the beatific vision, not only just, you know, not just an, after the second coming and final judgment. Um, um, so somebody's asking, do I think hell, and I assume you mean hell of the damned, will evolve into limbo? I think that's also the perspective of some. I actually, I think that was Maritain's perspective. I, I, th I think I, I, I slightly confused his position. Um, I don't think his view was that all infants in limbo would go to heaven. I think his view was more those who are damned, they would eventually repent and have a natural union with God in limbo. I think that was Maritain's view. Um, I think the problem here is that uh, this concept of a post-mortem repentance is, is excluded in the Catholic Church. And you can even see uh, the Catechism of the Catholic Church attesting to that exclusion of the impossibility of a post-mortem repentance. So I think there's some difficulty with, with his position there. Um, is the mass offered for souls of aborted babies appropriate i think it's appropriate um 
but it's it's appropriate in from the perspective that it's a hope that we can have a hope is is the key term here um so again if you look at the mass the context and the language used is that we have a hope and we're entrusting them to god's mercy it does not assure us that they're in heaven so yes i think that those liturgies are appropriate um the church has been clear that there's an uncrossable chasm separating hell from heaven or limbo if it exists, uh, Cactoid Jim says. So um, Sorry about that. I somehow lost connectivity. Please let me know in there in, in the chat if y'all are still now able to hear me. Um, for some reason, I think the internet connection cut out on me for a second there. Um, but but going going back to the question um, that Cactoid Jim or the comment here, um, the church has been clear there's an uncrossable chasm separating hell from heaven or limbo. So yeah, um, there's there's luke 16 that talks about how there's this chasm between um the hell of the damned and limbo of the fathers that's distinct from heaven and that's also distinct from limbo of infants um so though th we would need to make some important distinctions there um so this 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 chasm also that we see in Luke 16, there's that chasm, but then the question that I imagine Maritain would ask would be, but is that chasm that's in, you know, this uncrossable chasm, chasm right now that you have between those two sections of hell, if you will, is, is that perpetual? Is that eternal? I think that's where somebody who holds Maritain's view would, would challenge that they would say that okay yes it's it's uncrossable right now but after the final judgment it's not uncrossable i think that's kind of where they would come from again i think the weakness of the argument there is not that it's not conceptually possible but it's so novel <laughs> you know what it's 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 so novel should we really trust that view given how novel it is you know um I think we need to be suspicious of novel things. That doesn't mean they're wrong, but we, we, we need to have some trepidation there. Um, Sebastian asks, does baptism remove original sin? Yes. Also, the desire of it uh, can remove it. Um, let's see. Jan Just Janice says, I don't believe any babies go to hell. Well, again, the Council of Florence says that... Um, those who die in a state of original sin, which would be a, a, an infant since they contract original sin, um, if they were to die in that state of original sin, they would go to hell. It explicitly says that. But again, hell is understood here as limbo. Um, do they go to the place where those who have committed actual sins go? No. That's why I defined my terms at the beginning of this, this video. Uh, let's see. Anything else there in the chat? Hmm. Um, what about the holy innocents if they are saints how so given it they they had no difference in desire from aborted uh babies yeah i mean two things somebody might say well the holy innocent situation is um is is that they were they were actually martyred for the name of christ uh so that that's more of a situation of baptism of blood whereas that's not necessarily the case for an abortion right um people would make that distinction people would also make the distinction that um that was prior to the ascension uh rather than after so there there's there's some distinctions that one would make that would say the case of holy innocence doesn't solve this issue um uh good question though i do think i see a super chat so let me grab that real quick 
uh, Jess Bermudez. When postmortem repentance is denied, it seems to be uh, because of the lack um, of a body to change one's mind. If the resurrection place is all back in space and time and changeable bodies, isn't it possible? Right. I, I totally understand that that logic. I completely understand that. And and so that's a that's a genuine question to ask. Um frankly i i don't necessarily understand why that would be an impossibility once you've already had um your your resurrected body given back to you aside from the fact that it it does seem that divine revelation excludes this post-mortem repentance so though i may not be able to explain it philosophically how that works I have to go with divine revelation that seems to overrule that concept of a post-mortem repentance. So that's my difficulty with the post-mortem repentance con con concept is it, it just seems to be excluded by divine revelation. But I'd like to hear more if, if that's not necessarily the case. Um, I see a, a question about the Apocrypha. It's unrelated though. So please, please um, try to stick on topic. Um, but the condemnation of the Apocrypha, such as the Gospel of James, uh, are, are they dogmatic? Are Catholics still allowed to believe that these may be authentic? Um, what's dogmatic is the ruling of the Council of Trent on which books do belong to the canon. That's what's dogmatic. Um, so that's slightly different, different than what you're referring to there. Um, so Pope Galatius or Pope Innocent, those, those aren't necessarily definitive decisions there all right i uh hope y'all enjoy this I, I gotta head out here they i think they gotta use the studio in just a little bit plus i need to go get some lunch i will be live on the air catholic answers uh 3 p.m pacific time 5 p.m central which would be i think 6 p.m eastern time somewhere around there uh so I'll, I'll be doing the first hour of open forum here in just a little bit with catholic answers so y'all stay tuned uh call in ask me questions um, you know, support me, share it on your social media, all that good, good stuff. And, uh, yeah, stay tuned for that. That'll be in just a little bit. It will be live. So basically live phone calls, open forum, Q and a, you know, so call me, ask, ask me any, any questions that you want. Please don't try to troll me though. Uh, <laughs> those would be screened from the, the call screener. So, uh, anyways, uh, call me with any questions that you have then I'd be happy to answer them. So stay tuned for more. Hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. Make sure to also like me on your social media and check me out patreon.com forward slash reason and theology if you want to support me and what I'm doing here. Also go and hit that subscribe button to Catholic Answers if you haven't already. See you later. God bless.